So good afternoon, good evening. Welcome one and all, you're joining me here today. We're gonna to be taking a tour of Richmond. The weather is very, very nice. We've started here uh, in the village of Easby. So we are about a mile or so outside um, Richmond and we're gonna be walking down the River Swale into, into the town centre. I thought we'd start up here for a couple of reasons. Firstly, there is spectacular country which you're gonna experience. We'll start with a horse up against Easby Hall. Look at that beautiful white horse. How nice is that as a way of starting a tour up here in Swaledale? David Howarth joined us, Linda's here. It's a beautiful look at that blue sky. How nice to be out here. Once again, Swaledale today, so back in the Yorkshire Dales. And uh, we've only got for you to start with another ruined monastery. And we've got Richmond Castle over there on the skyline. So uh, without further ado, we are in, the horse very, very still, yeah. Um, we are in the village of Easby, spelled E-A-S-B-Y. Uh, we're on the edge of Richmond. And uh, we're kind of in the hamlet, if you like, of a monastic religious community, um, the community of St Agatha. Is anybody aware of St Agatha? Probably one of the lesser known saints, but um, it's got more horses here, they're absolutely beautiful. Um, St Agatha was a third century saint from Sicily. So after Milan, Milner, she's a frequent flyer to Sicily. And uh, some of you may have come across her because um, she is the patron saint of uh, breast cancer, um, of unfortunately rape attacks, um, breastfeeding, and a whole thing to do um, with the female breast, because that's part of her story. Um, in case you're not kind of unfamiliar, beautiful horses. Um, we've got the old church here. So this is the first church of St Agatha that dates back originally to the sixth century, part of it. And uh, so St Agatha, it sounds like Adrian, uh, so Triest is it, has been, ah, Triest has been and seen the paintings, fantastic. So we'll come to that in one minute. But just a little primer then on St Agatha, died very young, I think she was 20, maybe 21 when she died. But basically she committed herself to being a Christian virgin. So in the middle part of the third century uh, on the island of Sicily, which of course was part of the Roman Empire. And it said that she was, of course, a, a great beauty. Um, and so the Roman prelate, I can't remember Quintilius or some, some sort of, you know, we, we shouldn't ever remember the names of the, the perpetrators, remember the names of the victims. So, so this is Agatha's story, not his. He basically tried to force her to be his wife. She refused. So he had her kidnapped, initially placed in a brothel, but by God's will, her virginity was, was, uh, was protected. So he still sort of refused to kind of give up on this and uh, had her brought out of, 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 of kind of um, uh, in captivity, as you might say. And uh, he then basically said, look, you know, you've got to marry me or else you get tortured and put to death. And she put her faith in Christianity. And so he went through with it. And he had tortured horribly. Uh, and most famously part of that involved pulling off um, her breasts which is pretty horrible, with tongs, with torture implements. And so, um, you know, pretty nasty. So co consequently, she's sort of forever associated um, with that part of the, kind of the female body. Um, she died in prison, which is only about 20. Um, anyway, so St. Uh, Agatha, um, you kind of revered saint of the early church. And this is her church here at Easby. And as Treese was saying, it is very, very famous um, because Inside, we can't go in, unfortunately. I'm going to come back here and I'm going to do 360 filming so we can see inside it all in, in, in high quality. Um, there are wall murals. Now, wall murals were basically everywhere in medieval England. All the churches had them, but then at the Reformation, they were painted over. And the reason why every church had them was they were cheap, okay? Especially compared to stained glass. And they were kind of quick, quite quick. And of course, what they would do for, you know, a, a population that wasn't illiterate, that wasn't literate, is tell the stories from the Gospels. So I've got a few examples here to show you from inside this church. This really is kind of the, the high point, if you like, of, um, of this. I'll, I'll put up a couple. So this is obviously Christ being taken down from the cross in this particular uh, image. So very, very high quality wall murals. And uh, as I say, all the churches had them, but under Edward VI, who was the, the surviving son of, of King Henry VIII, when he came to the throne, there was a kind of cabal of very, very powerful um, Protestants. And they decided that, you know, all these things should go. In effect, they were sort of Catholic, um, you know, in the kind of presentation. Everything was whitewashed. And so every church in England then 
went across to the much more austere, you know, if you like, presentation that we think of with, with kind of Anglican churches, which is obviously all the kind of grey uh, and just the stained glass. But this is what they would look like. And so basically what you had was a, a generally speaking, a, a sort of series of representations of things from, from the Gospels, um, but also in this way, obviously, Christ being laid out there. Um, it's absolutely magnificent uh, inside of this church. We'll, we'll go in on another day and do some kind of filming in there. It will be an at-home tour, um, but it's absolutely magnificent. But they also have the labours of the hours. It's really beautiful, isn't it? Um, and so the labours of the hours, basically, is kind of... I'll show you one more, actually, before we do. So this, that you see there, obviously, Adam and Eve at the trees. So they cover the entirety of this church inside. Trees has been, she'll tell you, it is absolutely amazing. Sect and on, there's no other churches that have got this kind of quality. And it was found accidentally in the 19th century, kind of knocking off old render and suddenly underneath it all is this. So it really is quite, quite magnificent. But they also have, as I say, uh, the labour of the hours in here, which is uh, kind of representations of the kind of the medieval farming year and obviously what people were getting up to. So in this case, you can see there's a guy doing pruning or some form of kind of harvesting. Um, on another, we have uh, a guy, can I see that one? Where's that one? That one, there. Uh, in this one, you can see the guy is doing uh, sowing, sowing of seeds. So, you know, consequently, they're representations, you know, of, you know, the farmhand at work, doing God's work, you know, kind of bringing God's bounty uh, and kind of feeding everybody as a kind of result of that. So very much kind of deified. Um, so that's in there, so we're gonna go back. but. What we've also got here is Easby Abbey, which is quite, quite stunning. I mean, it really is, um, you know, a place this. I mean, you, you know, we're so York fortunate, really, in Yorkshire to have, you know, kind of all these places that I'm able to kind of bring you to. And, uh, and just to kind of share. So this is, um, we're going to go in, but the signal's a bit choppy in here. So um, I'm going to kind of show you a bit of it but then come back on another day and do some kind of filming offline uh spinning okay um so i say we're in swaledale and uh, you know we're on our way to richmond but how could we not pop in and have a look at these ruins of easby abbey it's like a medieval monastery on the banks of the river swale the bank the, the swale on our left hand side we're going to be walking on the swale on our way into richmond i mean look at this sky we couldn't have picked could we you know a better uh, weather for this tour. It is absolutely magnificent. So I'm going to give you a flavour of this, but then I'll say we'll come back on another day and uh, we'll do some 360 and kind of really show you we're not relying on the signal. It's huge, uh, Tish. I don't know if Tree sort of came, I assume she did when she was here because it's right next door to the church, but uh, it is fantastic. So um, what we know about this abbey is this abbey of St Agatha was founded in 1152 by a chap by the name of Rold, Rold, like Rold Dahl. He was the constable of Richmond Castle. And the inhabitants were, were, were canons rather than monks. So it's just a slightly different, but it's a very similar religious community they lived here, but living under a different system of rules. And uh, lived, attached to a kind of cathedral. Um, and so these monks here, these clerics rather, the canons, abided by the laws of St. Augustine rather than St. Benedict. And they were known as, like, it's really hard to say to it, pre-monstratensian monasteries. There's only, th there's only three in England when this was built. So it's very, quite, a, quite a rarity. Um, but it's likely there's a rigid community already here that was then probably absorbed into the new abbey. So we'll have a little potter through. But if the signal drops as we go through, don't worry, it should come back. But obviously, as you'll know, the stone and 4G are not best friends. Um, so this, I'll try and take one more time, pre-monstratensian order was founded in France in 1121 in a place called Primont uh, by St Norbert of Xanten. And uh, so most of the monks, as I say, followed the sixth century rule of St Benedict, um, renouncing the world for a kind of competitive, contemplative life. But Norbert elected instead to follow the older rule of St Augustine, which kind of better fitted his aims that Primonstranzinsians um, should be out there in the community out and about doing teaching, preaching, charitable work, and sometimes direct services as parish priests. Um, and in this, they shared many, many links um, it, it, with the Franciscans. We're gonna kind of talk about them a bit, little, little bit later on. So, um, but they were very heavily influenced by the Cistercian order. Um, borrowing their kind of rules for founding abbeys, these were lay brothers who carried out much of the work. It's a really big site. Like I say, we've got a little taste of this now, and then we're gonna come back and, uh, 
and do this with a 360 camera a bit later. Isn't it fantastic? Um, and they wore white robes. So they're known as the White Cannons. Um, and the Abbey owned flocks of sheep. Um, and from a very early stage, and sheep farming seems to have been the kind of main means of kind of support. So Eastby seems to have prospered in the later kind of 12th and early 13th centuries as the kind of number of cannons increased. And the original domestic buildings here were kind of replaced on a very grand scale indeed, which you can see. So it really is very sizable. It's actually kind of unorthodox. And again, when we walk sort of through um, properly you know, with the camera, and I'll kind of give you a proper narrative of where we are and what we're looking at and this, that and the other. It's actually rather unusual. And for a start, this area on the cloister isn't square. So it seems to have been built to kind of just accommodate the landscape, for, you know, held in by a rising hillside on one side, the river on the other. So they've kind of worked it into uh, the natural feature of the landscape rather than kind of start up with that kind of blank palette of, you know, like most of the ones that we've been to, um, like kind of Byland, like where were we the other week, uh, but Jervo, you know, much more kind of uh, uniform in their construction. This one's a bit of an oddity, but I say, we'll explore it more at our leisure, but isn't it beautiful? And look at that sky. And uh, this is why we come on live tours, ladies and gentlemen, all of us together experiencing it. And uh, of course, you're watching this later on YouTube in the future. Hello to the future, everybody. But uh, to me, you can't beat live and say, you were here when? And it's the first time we've been done here as well. Hello, Leslie. Let's on. So let's take a, let's take a, a gradual sort of mosey, I think, uh, down towards uh, Richmond. Um, it's, just love this space. That light's problematic. Oh, we're trying to be back to the light, which isn't ideal. We're trying to point something in the light. Turn around and use the light to be a photographer. Easby. Uh, yes, it is KTM. E-A-S-B-Y. So Easby, that's it. Isn't it magnificent? Yeah, so we'll come back here with the 360. So Rolls' descendants sort of continue to hold um, the constableship of Richmond with the lands attached to it. And through the 12th and 13th centuries, um, they named themselves Burton or de Richmond. Um, but in the 13th or uh, late 13th, early 14th centuries, we don't quite know why, they saw that there are estates in stages. And so the patronage of Easby, in other words, where we are now, um, passing the senior line to the Scrope family, who are landowners of kind of knightly rank based at Bolton in Wensdale, the famous Bolton Castle, of course. And uh, the Scropes made Easby their burial place. So within this, we've got burial crypts. So again, we're going to have a look at those when we are um, you know, visiting with, with the 360 camera. Um, but it seems that then their status and fortune improved because they got a family burial plot at York Minster. So there's lots of Scropes in there. Not Scropes, Scropes, Scropes. Um, and they've got a very, very famous uh, relation. So Richard Scrope, you may have heard of, was Archbishop of York. And he's buried in York Minster, which is not greatly surprising. Many of the Archbishops of York are. What is surprising is that Archbishop Scrope was put to death. He was executed in York, beheaded in public in front of a huge crowd because he got himself involved in politics and an uprising against the king. So. Uh, there aren't many archbishops that have been executed. Richard Scrope is one of them. And in 1405, he paid the price in York for his treachery against King Henry IV. So Easby was closed in 1536 as part of the suppression of the monasteries of the, was he Henry VIII. And the, by this age, the community had just dwindled to about 11 canons. And the abbey and its lands were let to Lord Scrope of Bolton for £300 a year. So by this time, much of the north was kind of rising in support of the monasteries in what became known as the Pilgrimage of Grace. We've talked about this before, this, this kind of coming together of devout Christians, Catholics that weren't at all convinced about what was kind of going on, along with all these kind of laid off clergy. And uh, Richmond was a kind of major centre of the uprising. And in December 1536, the town's bailiffs uh, restored the canons to Easby. In other words, they just stuck up two fingers to Henry VIII and they re-employed the canons. Um, and so a monk from nearby Solly Abbey visiting was told by a group of townsmen that, that uh, you know, our house of St Agatha, rather than let it go down, would all prefer to die. But by the spring of 1537, the leaders of the pilgrimage of Grace had missed the chance to defeat the forces of the crown. And on the 22nd of February, a vengeful Henry VIII wrote to the Duke of Norfolk, who was engaged in crushing the rebels. And he said, at your repair, in other words, as soon as possible, go to St Agatha and such other places of made resistance. You shall, without pity 
or circumstance caused the monks to be tied up, which means hanged, without further delay. So those that are involved in the uprising, the monks, were sentenced to death. So let's, uh, let's kind of walk on. And then the Abbey returned to Lord Scrope um, into his sort of possessions. And so despite the fact that he'd been, his, 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 his family strongly um, associated with treason and seemed to have been, you know, played quite a role in the Pilgrimage of Grace, he, uh, you know, he kept his lands, probably paid a hefty bribe, hefty fines for it. Um, but then after this, uh, this sort of suppression, so the continued as a parish church, in Agatha's church, uh, we talked about obviously the war murals that are in there, um, but also, um, you know, then really it was kind of left to sort of go to rotten ruin, and as usual, the stone was, was largely kind of taken, I and mean, it's surprising how much stone is left here, um, kind of repurposed for kind of building other things. Um, but then in the 18th and 19th century, it's kind of rediscovered by the Romantics. Um, J.M. Turner painted here, I think, between 1816 and 1818. But, you know, all these kind of very, very wealthy guys that were kind of looking to kind of you know, come back into, uh, you know, the, the Romantic era, rejecting the Industrial Revolution, you know, all that kind of, um, what's, what's the William Blake, you know, Jerusalem, you know, dark static mills, and kind of you know, just coming down here, dressing up, playing around, kind of getting involved and loving, uh, you know, the kind of medieval. Um, so consequently, it kind of got a very, you know, popular place for, for, for visitors, for kind of tourism, which isn't greatly surprising, because it is lovely. It is for the protection of English heritage, and uh, they're doing a solid job of looking after it. And of course, it's free and accessible to get into, so that's great. Um, so, let us walk on. Try leaving and rejoining. Are people having problems? I hope not. But uh, it is English heritage, yeah, absolutely. So uh, let us uh, kind of walk on. So I'll just take a sip of water and then we will uh, we'll be with you. You'll be able to start hearing the, uh, the noise, the sounds of the River Swale. We are absolutely on the banks of the Swale. So uh, just bear with me one minute. Hello, Linda. Are oh, we having a nice time? I hope we're enjoying the sights and sounds of Swaledale. Nice to start with a monastery here. The sun's just gone behind a cloud, so it's not as bright as it was, but at least I think we managed to get that really nice footage in um, a very style thing you have to do when you're live streaming. But uh, we've got the River Swale over here on our side, and we're going to follow the River Swale now um, all the way into Richmond. And if the signal drops down here, don't worry. Uh, I'm, I'll keep going. Stick on this channel. I'll be back, you know, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. There's bound to be the odd spot, but I didn't manage to do all the testing all the way down here. Look at these four lovely cottages. It really is a, a beautiful spot. But uh, Elizabeth could live here, I dare say. I think Marlene is on. She'll be looking out for properties as well. Wait till we get into, uh, into Richmond proper. You'll be spoilt for, uh, for choice. So we're going to make our way into Richmond town. So I say, if the signal bolts and holds, don't worry. Uh, I'll be back. I'll, I'm keeping walking, so we're going to walk into better coverage. But I can't say for sure that there isn't going to be interruptions because I didn't get a chance to do this full walk. I got held up, and uh, consequently, I haven't done the full walk. But uh, I know Richmond's fine. I've been here before. But uh, hello, Rose. Good thing. So how pretty is this? So we're now in walking what the swale on our left. I don't know if you can hear the swale of my talking, but uh, we're going to be following the, the, the River Swale into Richmond now. So you see, so sheep farming, see Swale, Swale, a beautiful country. I can imagine Agatha Christie movie being shot there, couldn't you? Yeah, that's an absolute beautiful quality. Um, and uh, so the river over here, the castle is in front of us. Actually, you see a 5G mast or 4G mast. So hopefully that will enable us to, uh, to get done without too much by way of interruption. So the River Swale, uh, I don't know if you know, but it's actually one of the most volatile in England. It's been known to rise three feet in less than 20 minutes, which is going some. Fishermen have been kind of stranded on rocks and many people have, uh, have kind of been lost in the flow of sundry annoyments and right in the wrong position where it wanted to be. Um, but never has people kind of settled in this area since, uh, well, since the earliest times, really, I guess you'd, you'd say. Um, there's been kind of local finds from the Neolithic or sort of Stone Age 
as we more typically call it. Uh, I've got a dark stalker on the ground. Is that my shadow? Um, I dare say. The sun is right behind me right now. Um, so stuff from the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, Iron Age, Roman period, you name it, there has been settlement in this area. And why not? I mean, look at it, how fantastically lush it is, how beautiful, how fertile, you know, for, uh, for keeping of livestock, in this case, sheep. Isn't that fab? Um, and one of the most kind of famous finds in this area is, uh, is a Bronze Age sword that was found by Catrick Bridge. Now, Catrick is the next village up. We're going to do a village tour of Catrick at some point. It's a military said to form a Roman town, very, very beautiful place. Uh, but it was found at Catrick Bridge in the Yorkshire Museum now, and it's discovered in 1992. So I'm going to bring up a picture of this sword, but I can find it. Here it is. So this was found in 1992, just near here, and it's believed to date back around 2,500 years BC. So what's that? Two, 25 centuries before Christ. So that's the kind of a, the age of settlement we're talking about in this area. So it's a public footpath walking on, but it's also private. I'll let this lady come through. So we're not, uh, we're not getting in her way, holding up her, her day. And I'll even point the camera away from you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just kind of pan up here. So you can have a look at the sword there, just while we're doing it. And uh, let's just get rid of that. And, oh. That wasn't very skillfully done, was it? Okay, so here we go. I'm still boggled by this open space. Yeah, well, we are spoiled for choice. This is North Yorkshire, Linda. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a land of land, if that kind of makes sense. Insofar as that, you know, this is, we're going to talk about this extensively in a minute, but you know, just to kind of kick us off really, this is an area where money, maybe like Texas, I don't know, or something, you know, some of these places, you know, easy land. And see if we can go, I don't know if we can go all the way down here, but we'll see. We may have to turn back. I haven't done uh, on footpath only. Okay. Stay on single footpath. So hopefully this will allow you to, uh, to get an earful of the River Swale as well. Um, so the River Swale, uh, yeah, so, so just to finish that up, yeah, money around here is land. Yeah, it's not, it's, it's not merchant wealth. It's not like West Yorkshire where the money kind of came from, you know, kind of textiles and business and manufacturing and industry and this other. Wealth here is old money. Okay, much of it associated with the Norman Conquest we're going to be talking about again. We were talking of that kind of root story of North Yorkshire um, is, you know, the, the, the money that was kind of made uh, by kind of land and from rents and, and all those kind of things. So consequently, the signal's a bit iffy here, but bear with us and we'll just keep walking through it. So don't disappear if it's freezing. We will uh, we'll keep going. So the River Swale is a kind of major tributary of the River Ure, uh, which becomes the River Ouse. We've talked about this before. When we're in Wensleydale, we looked at the, the River Ure, didn't we? Um, and then it flows out by the Humber to the North Sea, the Humber Estuary. Um, and the river gives its name to Swaledale, which is the valley through which it flows. So, not surprisingly, here we are. We are in Swaledale. So, um, we have got the right to roam. These, these are public rights of way, well established um, by law. It can be a devil of a job at times, getting landowners to accept public rights of way, but obviously not so much in this part of the county, but uh, there are certain landowners that are, are not entirely, uh, don't entirely play by the rules, as you might say, and have a tendency to block and obscure and try and put off and deter people from walking. But uh, as Leslie puts it, we've got the right to roam. Um, for those who are interested, look up the great Kinder Trespass. Was that in the 1950s, I believe? Kind of really fundamental, um, but again, social action, um, where basically an ancient put right of way was kind of re-established by a bunch of people just kind of walking on it and making a protest. So fabulous, good, good for them. Um, so River Swale uh, has kind of been obviously a contributory factory in settlements around here for centuries. You know, obviously you need a source of water. And what's great about the Swale is it moves really, really fast. And that's great because obviously in the times before there was clean water, before the sanitation, if you, <coughs> if you can you know, have your nasties, let's not go into great details, 
washed away pretty quickly, replaced by clean, fresh water, you've got kin trespass. That's it, Susan. You know, you've got the, you know, the, the, the makings, potentially, of a sustainable community because you've got something approximating clean water. Even in an age where, uh, you know, is it 1930s? I beg your pardon. Thank you, Leslie. Um, even uh, in an age where, you know, there wasn't sanitation and clean water, if you've got water that moves fast enough, that really helps. So consequently, um, you all across this peak district, thank you very much, filling in my knowledge. So I think that, that kind of right to roam, as Leslie says, you know, it's something that's a treasure. And uh, when it's as beautiful as this, you get to walk past the River Swale. This is why I thought, well, let's do this today. I'll just go for a walk around uh, uh, Richmond itself. Let's take a roaming way. Because if nothing, North Yorkshire is a county that is absolutely designed for walking. Uh, and, and this is an absolute doozy of a location. If you're into walking, look at these, by the way. They're pretty, the flowers. On here, I'm not going to step over the, uh, the tape. I'm going to... Hello, Patty. I'm going to take you to the rules. But uh, is it so lovely? Last of the daffodils uh, over here. Patty's joined us. So, obviously, it provided water, uh, which, of course, you need when you're raising crops, livestock. Um, but also it helped with the mining activities that have incurred here since Roman times before. You know, for mining, I'm sure you'll know, like panning, you've got to obviously wash, wash away an awful lot of silt to try and find you know, trace elements and minerals or whatever it is that you're, that you're looking to kind of um, extract. So again, fast moving clean water is incredibly useful um, in this. So for, well, it will be true. So this is the footpath into Richmond. So if you walk from Richmond to Easby, this indeed will be the path with which you walked. I don't suppose the River Swale has moved a great deal since you were here. So again, we're kind of diverging. The, the other path we could have taken is just behind this kind of screen of trees, but I'm delighted the internet seems to be behaving down here. I think it's always more fun to be very, very close to the water. And as I say, it's that connection with water and place that shapes human geography and history, doesn't it? You know, with, with the need to um, think about things that water can do. So for a start, obviously, drinking water. Washing clothes, washing bodies, providing uh, water for animals, you know, cleaning things, but moving things, boating, getting around, fishing. You know, it, it, it's absolutely, um, you know, kind of central, isn't it? You know, to, to kind of human existence it is a water supply. So it's no great surprise whatsoever that almost all our communities, look at all our cities around the world, that always grow up around a river, haven't they? I don't think there's any cities in the world without a river running through them. I mean, there might be in China or something, but for the most part, historic cities don't. You know, so the absolute sort of precondition is a good supply of fresh, fast running water is pretty much the norm for successful communities. So the early sort of settlements in this area are dated to the Mesolithic and Neolithic ages. So what's called the Stone Age, I think people, we all kind of know what we're talking about there, you know, pretty much prehistory. It's prehistory, it's not written down. We don't have dates or places. All we do is sort of carbon date things and look when we find fragments of bones and, and this, that, and the other, you know, tools that can have been shaped is they can, they can assess, can't they, with wood in dendrochronology and, and kind of other things, you know, to, to basically assess how old things are. But this is prehistory we're talking about here. Um, so flint tools, arrowheads, you know, the things that we can find that we know, um, you know, are kind of part of the way they fished, the way they hunted, the way they lived, the way they skinned animals. These sort of fundamental tools uh, that were used, this is typically, of course, what we you know is found, uh, uh, you know, uh, along this Now, isn't this lovely? Just let me, if we can get down a little bit here and the signal will hold, I'll just, because uh, there's no, nothing keeping us off here. It's not telling us don't go down here. So we will try. Absolutely right, and it's got it right. Where there's water, there's life. And of course, that's going to be a huge problem, I think. It, you know, it said is that, you know, if the wars of this century, you know, have been about oil and those kind of resources, they say the next century can be out water. You know, the most precious commodity of all. And some countries have got it by the bucket load, and other countries have got hardly any at all. So it's not difficult to, uh, to see where, how it's going to end up. Here we are on the banks of the swale. Now, isn't that... I'm going to shut up for a second, just let you listen to the river. something. Yeah, all the green leaves coming out. Yeah, we've got to 
hyacinth and bluebells. So we've got all the sort of signs of life are coming back, which is just fab. Dawn would like to go for a paddle. So what I actually dawn is because it's, it's, I'm surprisingly warm. I thought it was going to be a kind of cold one, but uh, usually with the sun out, it is, uh, it is fairly warm. So uh, around this area, there's been lots of uh, finding out stone circles, earthworks. So lots and lots of um, evidence um, that we can point to, to say with a very high degree of confidence that this was an area that was settled all the way back kind of in the Stone Age sort of period. And lead mining, we can trace back as well to uh, the Roman times. Um, and again, for, uh, for mining lead and getting, getting towards the ore, washing, very important. So again, being able to access water, incredibly important. Susan wants to stay here for a while. We've got a little pond, just kind of forming, a little eddying there, as you can see. The water, isn't this fab? And it's amazing what 4G can do now. When I started doing this three years ago, you, I just would, wouldn't have bothered. I don't know, Ian Brazeby, come down here, film it, show it from home. But now, incredibly, most of these places, you can get something out of the 4G. It is absolutely amazing. So if we've got any nature watchers, bird watchers, any twitches on, any fisher folk, you know, this is a place where I think the sound is just glorious. I'll just show up again for a second. Just listen to the, the movement of the water. Gorgeous, huh? So we know it's also part of the Celtic kingdom of place called Kachrith, which is now Katarik, uh, which is the next village downstream from here. Um, and in the late 6th century, the River Valley was invaded by Angles. So they came across the North Sea from what is now kind of Denmark, so the Germanic tribes, the Angles, and they settled in this part of Yorkshire. And the Celts that were here, from a little bit sort of further up the valley, tried to kind of dislodge them um, in the Battle of Catraith, but uh, the Angles held on and established themselves in this area. So consequently, this was Angles lands. So Anglo-Saxon, Angles, right? So that's where it comes from. Yeah, very tranquil, absolutely. Um, in the 7th century, St. Paul Lyons, I've probably told you about St. Paul Lyons before, he's the guy that consecrated the first minster that uh, converted King Edwin of Northumbria to Christianity. Um, he would come down here and uh, supposedly immersed thousands of people. Do you know if he got any Christians on? And he born again Christians on. Um, lots and lots of people. Um, they call this Yorkshire's River Jordan because it was used so extensively for baptising people. Um, probably not, not here, I wouldn't think, it's pretty shallow, but obviously where there's pools around. So, you know, the, the, there's kind of links with that kind of spirituality, the landscape and nature kind of shot through, you know, from St Agatha's uh, and, and the Abbey up there, to kind of Paul Linus doing baptism, really kind of an important part of, uh, uh, you know, kind of spiritual history of the, of the part of the world. And they still do, the, uh, at Catrick, uh Bridge, they still do these big uh, sort of mass baptisms. So we know there was evidence of the Angles settlement round by St Agatha's Church, where we were, um, and they found the Easeby Cross. I don't know if you've heard of the Easeby Cross, but uh, it's now in the Victorian Albert Museum. And it's regarded as the kind of the finest, I'm just going to bring it up for you to have a look, um, of the Anglo-Saxon crosses ever discovered. Um, and basically, if you look at it, you'll see, if I can get, if I can do it without messing up, which you normally do, you go. I'll just put that over there. So if you have a look, you'll see sort of depicting signs of nature. It's very kind of pastoral, it's William Blake-esque. Um, in it's in a myriad descriptions of flora and fauna and animals. And it's seen as an absolute kind of masterpiece. And that was discovered in the church at Easby. There's actually a replica in there now. The original one is in the Victorian Albert Museum. Because his, London has a great history of looting the treasures of the North. I may have mentioned that before. It doesn't stop it from being true. So we've got the replica. The original one is in the Victoria and Albert Museum. But I think what's interesting is this was made in the early 9th century. So it seems to reflect calm, nature, a sort of, you know, a paradise, you know, a heaven on earth, a Christian kingdom. But it's about to be ripped asunder by, of course, the arrival of the Vikings. I don't think the 20th or so years later that have been thinking about their world in those terms. Um, it was actually violently kind of upturned. We're now walking uphill, by the way, because you're hearing me slightly puffing and panting. But uh, I'm going to try. I'm not fully match, sit, match fit yet. I think it's a pity as well, Dawn, but there we go. 
That's a natural, nat national cultural policy. They reckon it's easy for us all to jump on a train to go to London. The nice for people in London to jump on a train to come to North Yorkshire. But there you go. That's politics for you. And uh, some very powerful people. Um, so by the middle of the 9th century, what we know is lots of Norsemen had settled in this area. First in the lower valley and then gradually in the upper valley where we are now. And they're attracted to the site where the castle now stands as a kind of obvious uh, defensive stronghold. So the Vikings spotted it. They knew what it was thereafter. They came and got this land. Suddenly, by the first note, he's down in Suffolk. Suffolk, I think, yeah. Suddenly, he's Anglia, and it's where they found a wonderful Anglo-Saxon helmet, and of course, also the remains of Fabulous Boat. Now, look at this water feature down here. Nature's not all by itself, but it goes to be garden centre, and uh, they've copied that look, right? It's a beautiful fresh water running down. So I'm going to bring you into shooting here the sound of fresh water in the Yorkshire Dales. Hope we don't need to do the loo. This isn't going to help. But uh, how peaceful is that? So we're now getting our first sights of the sky's got a bit grey, but uh, I can assure you, you can now see the castle through the other side. So uh, we are going to be seeing sights of the castle starting to come through. And of course, after the Norman invasion, the lands of this valley were given to Alan the Red of Brittany, who we talked about at uh, uh, Jervo. Same guy. Um, otherwise known as Alan Rufus. So I've got a picture of him. I'll show you again. Here he is getting all his freebies gifted to him by uh, William the Conqueror. Thank you very much. Says, uh, says Alan Rufus. Where is he? Here he is. So there he is, William the Conqueror on the left, in the red tunic, gifting Alan, Rufus, Red Alan, lands, and huge powers and huge wealth. So it's him that built the castle here at, uh, at Richmond between 1071 and 1091. So we're going to talk about that uh, in detail as we kind of walk around it. And it's built on what we call a bluff overlooking the River Swale. So we're kind of here, hopefully we get around this bend, I'll about to show you and pan up and you'll be able to see what we're looking at. Um, so Alan Rufus, alternatively known as Alan the Rue in French, Alan the Red, was the first Lord of Richmond. Um, see how it's just tying together? See? Rivers, castles, history. It's like I've done it before. Um, again, look at all this it's fabulous. It's dripping water. It's like the petrifying well at Mother Shipton's. Isn't that fantastic? Love that. Um, so he was a Brit Breton nobleman. He was a kinsman and companion of William the Conqueror, who was Duke William II of Normandy before he became our king, during the kind of Norman conquest in England. Um, and William the Conqueror granted Alan Rufus a significant English fief, later known as the Honour of Richmond. I'm just looking out for something as we kind of walk down. I don't know where it is. Um, in about 1071. So Alan had already held some property in Rouen, the capital of Normandy, and was Lord of Richemont. See where this is going? Richemont, this beautiful bridge. Uh, in Upper Normandy before the Norman Conquest. So Alan Rufus began the construction of Richmond Castle in 1071 to the kind of principal manor um, and centre of his honour. So Richmond Castle overlooks the old Roman fort at Catterick, North Yorkshire. Um, and Alan's properties extended over the entire length of the Urning Gas Street, became known as Ermine Street, the road to Edinburgh, from London to Edinburgh. Basically, he had land all the way. Um, and in kind of folklore, Alan also had an association with King Arthur, it's probably, you know, nebulous, rubbish. But um, in some version of the story, Arthur and his knights are said to lie at a rest underneath Richmond Castle, another reason it was built on that location. Um, and it's likely that Alan was with King William I and other members of the King's Council at Gloucester in Christmas 1085 when they discussed preparations for an extensive survey of England, later known as the Doomsday Survey. And on this survey was based the Doomsday Book, which comprises two volumes, <coughs> The Little Doomsday, and the great Doomsday. So through 1086, Alan and Robert of Mortan attend on King William, and uh, the book tells us that by 1086, Alan had become one of the richest, most powerful men in England. He's mentioned as the Lord or tenant in chief of 1,017 entries in the Doomsday book. So he's, be, he's third uh, behind um, 
William I and Robert Count of Mortam in the number of holdings. So that's how wealthy and powerful he was. Um, huge magnate in East Anglia and Yorkshire. Owned property in London, Normandy, Brittany, you name it. So Alan Rufus is the kind of third richest guy in the kingdom. Um, and he said that his income in 1086 was £1,200 a year, which of course was an absolute fortune. Um, now, during the major kind of ecclesiastical building of the 12th and 13th centuries, lead became really valuable. We all know, of course, about lead, both in the windows, um, you know, but also the roofs of churches, so it's in huge demand. So a huge amount of wealth was kind of coming out of this valley, increasing um, the, 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 the value um, to those who owned the land, his, his uh, descendants. Um, and we see evidence of um, 18th century pink called Hushing, which is where they created artificial dams, sometimes of stone, sometimes of uh, peat, whereby they the, the create uh, momentum, you know, if you like, turbulence in the water, which in turn then would, uh, would allow them to kind of silt through, you know, like, like water sifters, like panners, like in the gold. So basically to flush away all the silt and the rubbish to leave behind the ore. So we're going to see an example of that a little bit later on. Um, uh, and somewhere on here, I don't know where it is. It's, it's annoying because I haven't been able to find it for you. But we're going to have a look at this bridge in a second. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, there is what they call the Drummer Boys. Uh, monument and I couldn't find it um, so when, when I put this up uh, I'll, I'll see if I can drop in a picture of it because we haven't found it um, and basically in the 18th century the legend has it that um, they found from the castle a, a little tunnel leading away and they didn't know where it went to now the, the, the entrance was so small that uh, they weren't able to uh, get down those men so they found the smallest of their drummer boys um, and they got him to enter the cave with his drum. And what they said was, you go down there, right? They volunteered him, you know, he was volunteered as you say, um, and play your drum as you walk along, and then we'll be able to hear you from above, we'll follow it and we'll be able to find out where this tunnel goes to. Um, so this is kind of what happened. So he, he, he's going along, he's, he's drumming as we, uh, as, as we kind of talk, and uh, the soldier able to follow the course of the tunnel above ground. Um, and the sound was kind of clearly heard as they proceeded down the tunnel, went away from the castle, across the marketplace, down through French Gate, beside the River Swale towards Easeby, so where we could have come from. But when they reached Easeby Woods, which we've just been walking through here, Easeby Woods just behind us now, um, the drumming ceased. And somewhere around here, I was looking for it, I just couldn't see it, there was a stone to mark the spot where the drummer boy was last heard. You've never seen it again, so whether Maybe did it collapse? You know, we'll kind of never know, obviously, of what happened. But uh, obviously, he met his end down there. So it's known as the, the Drummer Boy Trail. Um, you know, he's never, he's never been sold. So one of the great mysteries. So this new bridge, isn't that beautiful? So there's, oh, there's a similar story, is there? Are we liking the bridge? Also known as Mercury Bridge. It was a, it's built as a railway uh, bridge, but isn't it beautiful? Absolutely love uh, this. I'm hoping we can walk down underneath the bridge uh, onto the parkland. I think we can, so we're not going to have to go on top of it. But look at that. In the old days of postcards, I would say, how's that for a postcard? Ah, I'm going to take a sip of water before we, we're going to go on look at the bats. And on this tour that keeps on giving, we haven't even got to the castle yet. Um, next up, we're going to walk towards a waterfall. So, by your goodness, you're being spoilt today, spoilt rotten. I hope you appreciate it, hope you're enjoying it. And, uh, of course, the only to do so, any support you can do, it's a bit of a, bit of a drive for me today, I mean, most appreciated. But I do think this is a tip-top location. It's our very, very first time. So, uh, you're seeing it for the first time, I've got a little squirrel down there, loving that bridge. So, this was um, built in 1857, um, to, so a brand new bridge, the, the original bridge, a little bit further downstream. Um, so, this was about carrying kind of railway lines. The Hexham Bridge, very similar, Hexham, lovely place. Core Bridge as well, beautiful. Up that way, Catherine. You know, the Core Bridge of the Roman, sort of centre Hexham, for Hexham, for those who don't know, up on Hadrian's Wall. Beautiful part of Northumberland, gorgeous part of the country. Um, so, Catherine, enjoying this tour. Thank you very much. I'm glad. So, let's come in and give you a nice close. We'll try and keep the bridge in shot. We'll try and give you some water movement as well. We'll try and exclude everything from the outdoors and just give you a sense. So, Let's create drama. So any photography, creating lines that run from one side to another, often seen to create drama within images. 
So Rufus Well, um, so this area of parkable we're going to walk across now is known as the Bats. And um, whilst this is kind of normally sort of seen as a very kind of upmarket area, uh, this is kind of part of, of, of North Yorkshire, actually there's an awful lot of uh, industrial revolution activity going on here, uh, industrial mills. So again, because actually the, the, what looks very green and lush, it's not good arable farming around here, it's livestock farming, you, know, you get a lot of stone very close to the surface, it's very, very difficult to plough that livestock. But also, of course, because you've got this fast water course, you've got the ability to get a clean uh, textiles. So the ability, of course, to, when you're talking about sheep's fleeces, you need a lot of water. You need urine, still urine. Fullers, we've told, told this story before, haven't we? For those who haven't heard me tell this story, um, people would sell their urine. If any of you anywhere in your family tree have got a family by the name of Fuller, it is almost certain that they were people that traded in human urine. And human urine, the uric acid, when the urine went stale, mixed with the soft water that you get that runs through the Yorkshire Dales, is very, very good at getting the grease off sheep's fleeces. In other words, it was much quicker and much easier than do the carding, which is obviously when you start turning the fleece into, into threads and so forth. So there's a huge advantage in uh, this kind of area. So fullers, any fullers on there, quite legit. And of course, the theft of urine, which happened, was taking the piss. Apologies for a little bit of crude language there, but that's where it comes from, because it was very, very frowned upon to, uh, to take the pee, as you might say. Uh, we don't have to repeat that. So one last pan across onto the bridge. How lovely, not a nice job, no, but then again, not a lot of jobs were very nice in those days. Dawn, you know, uh, it's far from the only job that involved pretty nasty so this is at Ripon Grammar School, by the way, over here. It's a free uh, school, sort of folded into various things, but it's, a, it's one of the oldest schools in the country. Um, it sort of dates all the way up to the medieval period. Um, it's the first school in Richmondshire, um, and it accepted boys and girls um, that could read and write. So chances are to get into it, you need some form, kind of, not really good right now because of where the light is, some form of patron to, uh, to kind of teach your children. So maybe a local cleric or somebody would see perhaps a child that had the wherewithal, the potential to learn to become literate, you know, possibly with the idea of them becoming a scribe, going into a clerical uh, job. So obviously clerical, we think of now as administrative, secretarial, but of course clerical means just that, you know, becoming a cleric. Um, in other words, in the church, you know, putting your, uh, putting your skills to the benefit of the church. So clerical work. Um, so... Its foundation date is unknown, but we know um, that, that it, it was certainly had an intake of pupils between 1361 and 1474. And it was given a charter uh, ratifying the status on the 14th of March 1568 by Queen Elizabeth I. So it is a very old school indeed. Very old school. And uh, so one, well, this, is a, this, this is the bats, um, this kind of parkland. So we've moved from woodland, now so there's a school. Just uh, on, the, on the back there, obviously the modern parts of the school, but the, the much older parts over there. We've got the town above the upper valley, and the river Swale, and the bridge. So we'll keep going. I'm going to take you down now to uh, to the waterfall, and then we're going to have a wander up into the town and walk around the castle. And uh, you think it's been good so far? It's going to get even better. So uh, stick with us. Stick on this tour. Do give me a like. Give me a subscribe. Drop a comment. Do all the things that, that are going to help me. To, so that other people can find my stuff um, because obviously what that'd be nice for me more people more numbers more uh, contributions uh, is the way that this world works for us so anything you can do to help with that it'd be fantastic so let's go down and have a look at the swale and uh, very shallow obviously at this point but uh, lovely times bring out we're going to go down to the falls just in a minute which is just in front of us but i think if this signal holds, we'll kind of walk this line because this is so, so pretty. Did bats which live here? Uh, now, I think bats is something to do with the, like the, you know, the, the, what you'd use to hit the fabrics, the, the fleeces, in order to, uh, to get the muck off them. You know, you know like beating a carpet? You know, what do you call it? Carpet beaters? Carpet sticks? Whatever. Anyway, thank you, Leslie. That, that's, I think, I could be wrong, but I think that's where it comes from. Uh, a bats field is, a, is, is the batting of... A, of the textiles to get the muck and the grime and everything else off that sheep pick up. If you've ever handled uh, a sheep's fleece, 
you know, they're not nice. They, they really, they feel greasy. I mean, you know, I'm sure those that are, are meat eaters, I think I may have to go up here. I'm not sure. Let's keep going. We'll see. I may have to turn back. I'm not quite sure. It's quite interesting. It's, got, it's actually sand down here underfoot now. Um, bat is in B. I think so, Susan. Yeah, I, mean, I could be wrong. Um, but I think that I read somewhere that's where the source of that term came from. Uh, yeah, I may have to come up because I want to get up on that wall up there so we can walk out onto the um, blah, 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 the fault. It's like a mini Ace Garth now. You know, it's like a, a tour of contrasts. This, uh, I would say, this destination, thank you, Elizabeth, that's so kind, has got pretty much everything. Um, you know, we're coming into waterfalls now, and then just around the corner, we're going to have a castle. It is, uh, you know, I cannot really begin to describe quite how. Um, Varied, distinctive, but a top-end destination this is for, uh, for anybody that likes to walk out and about. If you're coming, it's an hour away from, or so from York. Not great public transport, unfortunately. But uh, if you've got a car, if you're coming, then this is definitely a place. So, Linda, when you're coming up, maybe think about coming up to Richmond, that would be absolutely awesome day out for you. <laughs> hey, I'll keep you off the camera. <laughs> Hello. Do you, what, you want to be on the camera, dear? You want to be on the live stream? And say hello to everybody. Hello. <laughs> What's the name? Cooper. Hi, Cooper. That was Cooper. Little cameo appearance there. And uh, still having his say on the world. Roots are intertwined, absolutely. And, and of course, the erosion uh, that we're seeing here. So you see the roots completely exposed in the way that, the, that obviously the soil, which I'll say the soil in effect is now dirt dust, what do you call it, sand, um, so that's going to wash away, but they're cleaning on, which is pretty cool. So let me think, let me see, I think if I go back this way now, I'm going to try and get up onto the top, so this is like being in effect on a stony beach now, so um, it kind of, it sh it, I think it's indicative obviously of the way that this landscape can be transformed during uh, the floods, that very, very quickly where we are now can become und underwater, so you could tell, you know, for an afternoon, Get yourself a perch, get your rod out, do some fishing, and before you know it, you've got water around your ankles. It's that kind of place, because you've got such fast movement of water, um, and so consequently, everything can change very quickly. So one needs to take a degree of care. Have a look at that for a terrace garden. How nice is that? So live on a, live on a slope. What do you do? How do you get around that? Well, of course, what you do is a, your terrace. So different levels going all the way up. So you've got steps going all the way up to the house. So I'm back on the main path now. So this can now take us across to the falls. So we can now walk out on this top line. And I can show you the power of this. What a lovely sausage, wasn't he? Lovely. He, uh, he had things he wanted to say to us. All the gossip, as they say. Uh, so it's lovely to, uh, to feature Cooper and the nice lady on the tour. Because uh, we're live. And that's the benefit of the course. You can watch a polished YouTube video. But then edit that bit out. And I think it's more fun to keep it in. Which is why I like life. Uh, I make no apologies. It's not as swanky. Sometimes the signal drops. But it's real. And it looks like there's just been a, a race down here. I'm guessing everybody's in, in green. Looks like they've been on a, some exertion. So uh, I'm not entirely sure what they've been doing. But uh, I'm not going to film but You might see a sort of a posse of greenery down there. And they're all looking pretty exhausted and congratulate one another so I guess that they are a post activity so let's just try and get out on this wall over here and take you to have a look at uh, at the waterfall so I'm going to come around here so uh, give these people their privacy whatever it is that they are doing or have been doing I'm not entirely sure but uh, it looks like it's been pretty involving a great little exertion so as indeed as my work doing this. It's, uh, I'm definitely getting better shape. At the beginning of the season, I get pretty out of breath doing this, the up and downs. But uh, I'm definitely getting into better shape. So uh, by September time, I'm ready for Whitby, at least other places where uh, Lincoln, if I went to Lincoln again, my God, that is a tour. So here we are, so bring it out onto, have a look at the falls. And this pretty much is the last falls um, before they kind of hit the lower valley of the swale, on its kind of way down to York, so quite a lot sort of upstream from here. Um, 
But isn't it wonderful? Hopefully you're getting the volume. It is a, a really cool spot. I love it. And uh, behind us, but the sun's behind us, so I'm not going to show you just yet, um, is the castle we're going to have a look at in a, in a very short period of time indeed. If you watch that little snippet video that I put up the other day, we're about to be there in a minute, we've got a Bargate up that way. Um, we're going to be there in a few minutes. But I just thought that we would uh, take just a minute. Thank you, I'm glad that you think it's a beautiful tour. I think it's really special too. So again, thinking about this creating turbulence for industry, for textiles and so forth. Um, if you look at over here, the water is, I'm not saying it's still, it moves, but as you can see, pretty much, you know, slow moving, trickling, come around the corner, drops off the eddies and weirs and look at it. You know, you can see how that turbulence. So, you know, for the earliest times, we use the force of water. And of course, you know, it's part of, you know, the greening agenda, isn't it? Is how can we use water power effectively? Because it's free, it's sustainable. All right, you've got to invest to build the infrastructure to make it work. But, uh, you know, it, this just keeps on going. As long as there's water, obviously if we get droughts, that's a problem, I appreciate that. But uh, it has to be said that it, finding ways of harnessing this natural energy that's created for us seems to be a no-brainer. And yet, for some reason, our politicians keep getting stuck. And I really don't know why uh, why that should be, but uh, I guess maybe Greta Thunberg, the youngsters, have got a better handle on this, and they're going to show us as oldies what, kind of what to do, uh, because it seems we need to do something radically different, and uh, if harnessing water power is in our grasp, and bearing in mind this this meth, this you know, technique was used thousands of years ago, I can't see why we can't go back to using it. But hey ho, little mini was that a rant or a plea, whatever it was. Hopefully, it came across in the right spirit. So, uh, let's leave behind the waterfall because I think it's time for us to go and have a look at uh, at the rest of Richmond. Because, my goodness, we're already an hour into the tour and we haven't even got into the town yet properly. Such has been the uh, the chatter. And so we should see, you see. That's what happens when... Uh... So, I'm going to walk along Riverside Walk and uh, we're at Carveth Hill and we'll go up Bargate that way. So, I'm pretty sure... If I walk us down here, this will will take us. I think we're at Carnforth Hill will be on the right-hand side. Unless I've got it horribly wrong, uh, in which case, we have to retrace our steps. But uh, I think that we are... So, so this is Greenbridge, by the way, um, that we're just kind of walking across. Um, we didn't really kind of see from the riverside. But uh, that was built between 1788 and 1789. And somewhere... I'm not going to go back. It's over the other side. There is a a measuring um, between distances between Askrig and Lancaster because this was the site of a turnpike road. Do you know about turnpike roads? We've talked about these on various tours. J uh, Jack, Blind Jack in Nairsborough made turnpikes. Um, so basically it was in the 18th century when they started to realise that the road network was in such a poor state they basically created a very kind of investment friendly tax regime for people to invest in building roads and then getting uh, revenue from it. So there'll be, there'll be tolls to pay for these roads. So the, the Turnpike Acts kind of absolutely kind of kick-started the road infrastructure building in, in this country. And this is kind of one of them. So there was huge amounts of money to be made because of course, this also coincided with you know, the coaching inns and so forth. So you know, not long after you start to get the, the railways, which begin to eat away at the, the value of the roads, but uh, none of you see, first comes the castle up there now, up on our side. So beautiful reflection. I don't know if that's too strong, that sun, for, for, uh, for the camera. But uh, so, yeah, this is on the Richmond Lancaster Turnpike Road. Um, the railway did eventually come to, uh, to Richmond. Uh, there is a station, again, it was on the other side of the river, so we didn't actually get to see it. But uh, they arrived in the 1850s, I think. Um, so they built the second bridge that we saw, Mercury Bridge, 1857. So you must be around then. Um, but of course, like so many places, it became the victim of Dr. Beeching and his review. So there hasn't actually been a railway station here for, uh, I think since the 1970s, somewhere kind of in that kind of period. So uh, Leslie lives near Turnpike Lane with Dick Turpin, jumped to the gate of Black Bess. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It, it was kind of great for, for the highwaymen as well as it was for the coaches. You'll be, you know, because you imagine before this, 
you, you try and just pitted tracks basically, um, whereby it'd be terribly uncomfortable. So you're gonna sit on a coach, you know, at that time it was a four day journey from London to York. You know, four nights of stopping over and frequent change of horses, it'd be bloody uncomfortable. You know, so consequently the smoother the road can be, you know, the nicer it is for everybody basically. So consequently it was, uh, everybody really welcomed the development of roads. Um, obviously these days we tend to see roads as being kind of part of the problem, but at that time, roads were a huge part of the solution and of course once you create better roads this rapidly uh you know sped up journey times so as a result of that then you got sort of faster horses famously of course henry ford said if it asked people what they wanted they would have said faster horses rather than the motor car um but that's what it enabled you have to change the horses more frequently but they would cover ground very very speed oh he's, he's not, this is a turnpike um marker so built into the side of the road, showing, making it absolutely clear there was cash would need to be handed over in due course. So a bit like French motorways, you know, you pay to go on them. Or, or quite a few European. Do they have that in the United States, or Canada, wherever you are? Do let me know. Obviously, it's not really a big thing in the UK. We've got a few M6, the toll road around Manchester. I think there's one in Birmingham, but uh, for the most part, we don't really go for road road charging. Uh, here but historically we absolutely did so a uh, turnpikes wherever you hear turnpikes that's an indication that uh, this was one of these private roads that was done for uh, for profit basically and uh, bridge is another great source of profit so we've got another next bridge now um let's quickly show you this lovely old bridge it's a really lovely tour of bridges i hate dr beachy it's like a song that isn't it <laughs> Like highly high people, then they do something up, Dr. Beeching, um, as a kind of follow up. I see if you're cool. You're cool. I may have made that, I may have imagined that, but anyway. Um, so I'm just trying to get you a nice view of a. We paid up in road taxes, Leslie. A view that we shared by many motorists in this country who feel themselves to be uh, already here with the tax. So let's just a quick look over the bridge and then we'll head up because you keep saying there's going to be a castle here in a town and you haven't shown us it yet. Um, be patient, my pretties. All things come to those who wait. So I'm just going to give you a view. I'm going to step up here and give you a view. Darfur crossing, yeah, absolutely. And Queen Elizabeth uh, crossing as well. And uh, the one to Anglesey is. So there are a few. There's a the castle walls. Look, you see the curtain walls up there? How could I see? You can now see what a great site for castle this was. Because it's only accessible from the town side. It was really easy to defend on that side. So consequently, you totally see now why um, historically this site was true. I think I used the version of this photo for, for the kind of tour. So this is, you know, kind of from the bridge looking across the swale and seeing the castle um, up on the, the kind of top. So uh, let us walk down now into the town. I say walk down, walk up actually. It's going to be a lot of uphill now. So again, you know, it's like out of breath. Hopefully you'll forgive me and recognise that uh, it can get fairly strenuous doing this, but my goodness me, there's nothing I'd rather be doing right now than being with you guys here in glorious Swaledale in North Yorkshire, talking all things Richmond. And we've still got lots to see, um, but I'm aware that uh, the time is a cruel mistress. And uh, so let's get on with that. So we're talking of time, um, before ever those clocks, how do we tell the time? Well, as many of you all know, the ancient knowledge was that the movement of the sun could, uh, could indicate that. And so, of course, if you can do something that creates a shadow, hence a sundial, you've got a fantastic way of telling the time with great accuracy. And so on this house on the corner here, this white one, we've got a Georgian. It's on a lovely street down here. I haven't got time to walk down all these streets, unfortunately. But uh, suffice to say, Everywhere you go around here, it's just lovely. So this here, William Hutton from 1721. He designed that, uh, that particular sundial there, and very fine it is too. So uh, uphill time again, uphill and down dale, or I don't seem to get much down dale, it's uphill. So I don't know how, quite how I manage where my, where my down dale comes from, but uh, there we go. Um, all in the pursuit of knowledge 
and sharing this wonderful county of Yorkshire. And uh, so let me just cross over. So Cornforth Hill is where we're going up next. And uh, this is going to take us up to Bargate. So, uh, uh, so we're now kind of in this sort of really quaint market town of Richmond. And everywhere is just candy for the eyes, basically. It's bathed in history. We're kind of located in the rural heart of North Yorkshire. Um, this is absolutely, um, you know, a premium spot. Very, very, very expensive. So Scottish raids in the 14th century here devastated Richmond. The castle was kind of largely unscathed. However, to its defences, in case of another attack, town walls were built in 1312. With just a few small gaps, and the gap we're about to pass through is known as the Bar. And it's a vital link between, uh, between the marketplace and the bridge over the River Swale. In other words, for people to be able to bring in goods from the nearby villages and bring them in to the town. Um, it's a rather steep connection. <laughs> like so many places that I bring you, it involves a fair degree of uphill. So we're going to take it steady. I might shut off for a minute. <laughs> this is Cornforth Hill. But aren't the buildings beautiful? So, so beautiful. Lovely cobbled streets, drooling over the houses, absolutely. Premium, premium, premium. So, this kind of enabled a connection between the medieval town, its markets, and the surrounding villages. So, this is Bargate here, which is part of the medieval walls. So, there's not much of the medieval walls left. So, once we do, come inside this gateway. Like York, we've inter entered into the historic core. Isn't this quite, quite something, ladies and gentlemen? So we're going to go up the castle wall. So it was in Darlene Bar or Bar, the postern walls built 1312 to protect against Scottish raids. So how beautiful is that? Oh, just catch my breath. You wouldn't need the gym around here, no, absolutely not. You would be uh, absolutely fine just taking a turn around. So we'll go up to the sort of top walk now, the castle. I'm just going to show you what I'll do here. See. This building in front of us, and again, not sure how much you can see, I'll just try and give us. You see on the horizon there? Looks well, like a church tower. It's actually a folly, and uh, it was built in 1746, and it was originally known as Clodden Tower. So uh, I'm afraid if any of you are friends and supporters of Bonnie Prince Charlie, um, listen away now, because this was, I'm afraid, built to celebrate the victory at Culloden, Um And basically, it's a sort of giant two fingers up to the Scots. Now, the Scots border, historically, was a lot lower than it is today. So consequently, the areas of Northumbria, Durham, North Yorkshire were often involved in cross-border raids and so forth. So there was no love lost between the people of Yorkshire and the people of Scotland. So this was built by a chap called John York to celebrate the victory of the Duke of Cumberland's army over Bonnie Prince Charlie near Inverness in April 1746. And it's got a beautiful powder blue interior. So it's known as the Wedgwood Bowl. So any of you that are of a, uh, of a Duke of Cumberland persuasion, you can stay there. It is a very, very high-end holiday let. But uh, there we go. So, uh, as I say, I make no claims to support it or otherwise, but uh, that's what was going on when it was built. It was to celebrate the smashing of the Scots, but uh, let's face it, they've done plenty of smashing of us. Um, so the, the route we're going to walk around now is called the Bailey. Old Bailey, of course, famous in London. Um, and the Bailey is the area if you like, that surrounds the centre of the castle. So we're going to go on the castle walk. So the Mott, the central part. Here we have now Richmond Castle. How lovely is that? Um, so we're going to the marketplace, but first we're going to just do a loop around the castle. Give you some more views of the swale. Um, so it's kind of perched right above the River Swale, um, which kind of runs past the, the, the town. And of course, this lofty position was absolutely of great strategic value for, um, for, for Richmond. 
you couldn't really hope for a better location really. Um, and it kind of secured it in the early years for outside attack. And that kind of security is one of the main reasons that Richmond was able to develop as an important centre of power in England. So Richmond Castle was built in the aftermath of the Norman Conquest of 1066. And the kind of exact circumstances remain obscure, but it was likely kind of founded in the late 1070s by Count Alan Rufus, so Alan the Red we talked about a little bit earlier, the kinsman of William the Conqueror. And Alan, we think, may well have commanded the Breton contingent of the Norman army at the Battle of Hastings. In other words, he was there. He was part of, of, of William's army, we believe, leading the forces in that successful battle. So in return for this service, King William grants him land in the north around 1071. He basically is given most of Yorkshire. So Richmond Castle probably begun shortly afterwards to cement royal control in the north and to maintain vigilance over the border with Scotland, which as I say, the border was in a very different place to where it is now. So let me just give you, so we were sort of looking down from up, so now if you look at it from the other way, so we're looking down towards the, uh, the swale, I just see a car driving through the bottom of your picture now, the centre of the picture now, you get a sense of quite how high up we are, what a great defensive location this truly is. So as long as you can protect the access uh, from the town side, it was, <laughs> it, it was a really, really fantastic spot. Um, so there's no reference to the castle in the Doomsday Book, um, but it does describe the lands of forming a castlery. In other words, there was a community that would be able to sustain a castle. So as soon as that preparations were being made um, to build. And the early surviving parts of actually what you're kind of looking at here, a lot of the curtain wall um, was probably erected by Alan Rufus in the 1080s. So getting on for a thousand years, long stretch of this stone curtain wall, um, including the ground uh, around the other side, the ground entrance, the archway, of the keep and what's called Scotland's Hall. So no other castle in England can boast so much surviving 11th century architecture. So this that you're looking at obviously later above, you can see the different sort of stone texture, different colour, with a curtain wall going around it, 11th century. We're looking at England's best preserved Norman castle. And after Alan Rufus's death in 1093, Richmond Castle and his estates passed in turn to two of his younger brothers named Alan and Stephen. And by 1136, it was then held by Stephen's son, also called Alan, Alan II, who was the first assignment of the Earl of Richmond. So again, I'll just pan down across, so you get a sight of the castle and the river below us. It really is a fantastic... And this is all level, by the way, so if you come and visit from the town side, you don't have to do the route we did. You can come in and do a pre-level walk. And of course, this, this walk was created by the Georgians, promenading, very fashionable in the Georgian era, uh, this town. And so they, they loved to have a walk around the castle. Um, so... Um, it's like there's a royal mint here uh, in, the, in the 12th century that supported King Stephen. We talked about King Stephen when I was on the tour of Lincoln, did we not? Uh, and the anarchy. Of course, the civil war caused by Stephen trying to stop his cousin Matilda becoming the rightful king, queen of England. Um, and so basically during this time, you've got lords that are lords in Normandy and Brittany, but also in Richmond, which was kind of complicated. I and mean, Conan uh, was, was Alan II's son. Um, was, was kind of the first to really experience some of the difficulty with this. Because basically, on the one hand, because of the lands he owned in, in, in England, you owed fealty to the King of England. Whereas with his lands in Brittany and Normandy, it was the kings in France. And of course, England and France are almost constantly at war through this period. So you can see it's a pretty kind of schizophrenic kind of relationship. You are both uh, poacher and gamekeeper, uh, sort of simultaneously. So very, very kind of... A, you know, the politics is very, very difficult to manage. So lots and lots of these aristocrats were killed during this period because uh, they couldn't manage to square that circle. One or other of their overseers uh, would get pretty chewed off with them. And so, uh, but Conan was fairly successful. Uh, he controlled these lands from 1154 and spent a great deal of his time here over the next decade. Um, and it's in this period that he built the keep that we're going to see uh, in a couple of, uh, two or three minutes, I think, I don't know how quite long it's going to take to kind of walk around this, it's a kind of statement of his quite exceptional power and wealth. So Conan, as I say, is both a duke of lands in France, or modern-day France, but also over here. Um, he betrothed his daughter, Constance, to the fourth son of Henry II, so he's getting his daughter married into royalty. Um, and as part of the ingr agreement, as her dowry hands over his lands in France. So Constance was only nine at this time, um, 
So Henry II basically took control of these lands and it becomes a royal castle. And throughout the 13th and 14th centuries, it stays that way. So it's no longer held by the Earls of Richmond, it's part of the royal uh, estate. Um, but there's still long-winded disputes between Brittany and France and you know all the kind of complications that went with it. So I think probably people thought it's way too much hassle. I would sooner just have, because you know, the people were so rich and so wealthy, you didn't actually need you know, all these lands. Uh, probably a better way to stay alive was just give it to the king and uh, let him worry about the, the, the hassles with the king of France. So it's held by the English crown. So uh, we're kind of walking our way around the castle walk now. Um, that continued until 1372, when finally it was taken by the crown sort of full time. So it had been kind of lent out to the crown. It then sort of becomes um, actually part of the crown estate, part of the duchy of Lancaster. I think so too, Linda. So isn't it lovely this castle walk? So I'm going to see the keep in just a minute. I'm just raising up now above the best preserved keep in England. So the keep is the centre part of the palace. That's like the palace. So almost no attacks were launched on the castle until the 14th century, when two separate raids led to its downfall. Though the castle itself was kind of largely spared, um, the heir of Richmond subjected a gruelling Scottish raid after the defeat of English, English defeat at Bannockburn in 1314. So they weren't just being paranoid building these walls, they were needed. And after Bannockburn, um, where the, the Scots kind of prevailed, um, there was an awful lot of smash and grab in this part of the world. Um, the only other known attack was on the castle was subject to a complaint by John III, the Duke of Brittany in 1314. Apparently a local mob tried to storm the castle and burn it down. We don't quite know why, but locals besieged the castle and injured the Duke's servants. Um, but by this point, it seems the castle was in disrepair. Um, an, in an in inquest into his sort of death note, the castle was ruined and buildings within its enclosure did significant repair. Now, it certainly isn't like that now. I think the, uh, the keep is starting to come into view. So a survey made in 1538 showed it was derelict. And in 1609, a survey noted it was decayed. And the castle kind of remained in this condition for the next 300 years. Then ownership passed to the Dukes of Richmond in 1675. And uh, some repairs were carried out in the 1760s, uh, but mainly to the keep, the bit we're going to have a look at next. So the keep is the kind of central part. So uh, here we are. So the works of Turner, the artist, and other art in the, in the late 18th and 19th centuries kind of greatly encouraged um, the admiration of the castle as a romantic ruin. Um, and the town becomes a kind of fashionable place for, for tourists. So we're going to go around, we're going to see a little bit of the, the, the market hall, uh, the, the, the market square for a second, then we'll come back to that. But I'll show you the castle keep, and then uh, we'll see the market square and the priory. And then we're going to wrap our tour up. So there's still a bit more to come. So apologies that I've run a bit over the state of time, but I do hope it has been worth sticking around because I love it here. It is absolutely first rate. So coming into the market square, we're going to pass the market hall. And then uh, when we do, we will uh, we'll nip back in on ourselves. I might as well do it here, actually, and get you into the keep. Oh, it's here, actually. Yeah, fantastic. So here we are, so it's nearly a thousand years old. It's the best preserved castle, the Norman castle in England. And it rises 30 meters, 98 feet, but in the middle of the 12th century. It comes with the ownership of the England's medieval king, start with Henry II, and includes the infamous King John, he was here. Um, now in 1854, the Duke of Richmond leased it out and it became the headquarters of the North York Militia, so we can militia headquarters and barracks built here, and also a prison. And there's a famous story. Has anybody heard of the Richmond 16? The interest to that uh, everybody's heard of them because they were held here. And the Richmond 16 were a group of conscientious objectors during the First World War. Now, these are people either of faith or Methodists. Um, the, 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 there was all sorts of, the, the, there was um, people that were strong socialist beliefs, uh, various various kind of reasons, Jehovah's Witnesses, that refused to fight, and um, non-competence, and so they were brought here, and uh, and they were jailed. They were called the Richmond Sixteen, and basically um, they asked for exemption from military service to contribute to the war effort, um, but some still refused to get involved in the war effort at all. So consequently, they were jailed. 
Um, and it was decided in 1916 that a number of them, 16 of them that were detained here, will be sent to France. Because they were then put into a war zone where immediately they'd be subject to military orders. And military orders was if you didn't go into battle or do what you were told, you could be shot. So a different, completely different, if you like, burden of proof, uh, a different kind of requirement. Um, so if you've, you've been to this castle, there's lots of graffiti on the walls of stuff they kind of wrote while they're there. It's a very sort of famous sort of story, the, the Richmond 16. And um, so the walls are kind of covered in graffiti. So in May 1916, um, they're put on trial for refusing to obey orders and they face a potential death sentence. So they're transported to France for trial. Um, and it's because it's got a notorious case in the sentencing of, of, of conscious objection. So on the 29th of May 1916, the Richmond 16 was taken from Richmond Castle with serving members of the militia and transported to Henriville military camp near Boulogne in France. And once there, they were considered to be an active service, which meant they could face the firing squad if they refused to obey orders. So after arriving at the camp, they were given 24 hours to decide whether to follow orders or risk being shot. How far are you prepared to go? Brocklesby asked Renton, two of the most famous. To the, to the last ditch, Renton is reported to have said. And soon afterwards, the men were asked to move supplies at nearby docks. But both refused. Yes, you have to pay entry, yes, you, at least clothes is well done. Um, so they then court-martialed for refusing an order and found guilty. The day of sentencing was the 24th of June, 1916. And a senior later recalled that the army had a great show of these proceedings. Hundreds of soldiers were lined up to form three sides of a square. On the 4th, the commanding officer stood on a large platform to hear, um, the country of objectors rather, stood on a large platform to hear the sentences read out one by one. And each one was sentenced to death, to suffer death by being shot. Now this was very controversial and actually, all but one of them had their sentence commuted shortly after it was 10 years hard labour. But uh, the, uh, the Richmond 16, I've got a picture of them, or just to uh, give you before we move on, so you can see. These, uh, whether you agree with them or not, they, they certainly were men that were very brave, were prepared to die for their beliefs. Uh, and as a result, I think that, uh, that gives them the status now, I think would say, of heroes. Men of high principle, who were prepared to uh, surrender their lives for their belief system. Whether we agree with them or not, I think is, is out here or there. But this is where they were jailed before they were sent across to France. So the conscious objects are the men who refused to fight for whatever reason in the First World War. And uh, let's walk on. So let's go and find the market square. Goodness me, what a tour this is. And still a bit more for us to look at. So everywhere you look, you know, just fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. Um, buildings, but I think we will uh, we're on low power, so we've got 20% of the power left, so that will hasten our tour towards uh, conclusion. So uh, I will probably just see if I can plug in. It may mess things up, but if I can get this plugged into my battery, that will just help, I think, to uh, just bear with one sec. Can we get out a battery pack? We're going to the square, and uh, but I think we will, uh, we'll perhaps foreshorten um, some of the things we might have looked at. So we're in the, the Church of the Holy Trinity, uh, the Old Mother Church, uh, right in the centre of our picture. So we are in the, uh, the Town Market Square. So let me just try and get this, see if I can get this plugged into a power source. If so, that will just give us a bit longer on the road. If not, then we'll just head off to... Uh, hopefully that will, uh, that will give us some juice. So Holy Trinity. Um, 14th century church here on the marketplace. I want to show you this obelisk, um, kind of right in the centre, which is a kind of unusual uh, history. Insofar, oh god, fish and chips smell so good. Um, the obelisk had a very specific purpose. So I'll just pan around here. You can see it's a very, very large marketplace. This is still to this day a a market town. Market held here every Saturday. So there is often earlier today there'll be markets stalls around but the obelisk um unusual 18th century and uh, it was the water source so this was where you could come and get clean water now i've never seen anything else quite like this really it is quite quite remarkable but uh, there we go so that was in effect the water source so the source of clean water here in richmond this obelisk which is kind of like a napoleonic war memorial there's quite a few like this but uh, they are normally related to uh, commemorating the war rather than 
and they do clean water but uh, that is what this was there for so this was the market so we're going to come around and look for here before we, we go into Freya's wind for the final part of so you can see here in these various vestibules people come around and bring their vessel for, for carrying the water and they'll have a source of fresh water so isn't this a fab place great fantastic view right in the centre of the marketplace. So the marketplace runs right the way down to a kind of double size marketplace here in Richmond. Now, I did mention, I teased you a little bit earlier, didn't I, of talking about Richmond. Um, and this is the original Richmond, sort of. By the way, inside this is the Museum of the Green Howards, uh, a really important local regiment, 300 years of Yorkshire history. Their museum is in there, fabulous. Do visit if you get the chance. Um, um, the six pubs on the marketplace if you're thirsty it's a great place to uh, to go and abate your thirst um, the town hall pub next to the town halls the town hall pub there with the town hall sandwich in between the two so that's the end building that you can see and um, so the history goes back a thousand years but you see the kind of modern last four centuries here around the market um, that's kind of shaped the uh, the experience of being here so it's dominated by the Georgian and the Victorian era buildings. Um, so the Market Hall, um, just in front of us here, just with the castle sort of behind it. Um, and you've got markets here seven days a week, all year long. So um, on Saturdays, there's more stalls here. Um, and it's got a horseshoe shape around. So Trinity, Ch Trinity Church and the marketplace, the church just over here, is, if you like, the centre of the town. So the castle just off the centre of the town here. So going to be a wiggle on the thing because I've got a power cable plugged in. So uh, a market's been held here apparently since 1093 um, when they're part of the, the historic castle. So we're going to have a wander down to um, Castle Wind. The alleys around here are called Winds, Winds. Um, but Richmond. So there are lots and lots of Richmonds. Apparently there are 105, 115, something like that, around the world. This is the first one. So Richmond, Virginia, if it'll be done. Richmond, Virginia, or has been named after this place. Richmond in Surrey, named after this place. Because uh, Henry VII had inherited lands, and part of that title was being the Earl of Richmond. But the reason it came to be known as Richmond was because, of course, Alan, Rich, Alan Rufus had a place in France called Richemont, the beautiful hill, the beautiful mountain. And it said that this reminded him so consequently, the very first Richmond anywhere in the world was named by Alan Rufus, Alan the Rue, Alan the Red, after his beloved Richemont in France. So there you go. Even though this is the first, it's not really, is it? Richmond in British Columbia, Richmond in London. So yeah, Henry VII named Richmond. Um, he had a palace built down at Sheen. Um, so Richmond in Surrey, Richmond on the Thames there, is named after um, this one. So this is the daddy. This is the oldest of them all. So there we go. Holy Trinity Church there. We've got the obelisk. We've got uh, the, the, cap, the tower keep. We've got the market square. A beautiful blue sky. What more? What more could you ask for? Well, a couple things more. As if we couldn't get any better. It's a gift that keeps on giving. Hello there. We're now going to see. We can't go in, unfortunately. We're going to pass through Fry's Wine to the Georgian Theatre Royal. Because this was an incredibly fashionable place. So we've got to the bar to pass through here, the old part of the city walls. And, uh, and then we're going to be passing the Georgian Theatre Royal. And uh, it is an incredibly small, very, very cute. Uh, has anybody been to it or seen it on TV? It's a remarkable place. Um, I've got a picture of the interior here. And uh, where are we? That is from the stage looking out, which I think you'll agree is absolutely live. They're a little, little box, it's tiny. The whole thing probably maybe fit 100 people in. Max, mostly sit on benches. But um, it is, so it's here, look, the Georgian Theatre Royal, so I'll just get rid of that so you can see. Um, this is looking to the stage from the other side. So try and bring that for you. So it's so cute, but I mean, it's absolutely tiny. It's absolutely tiny, but absolutely delightful. Um, you know, if you're in this part of the world, it's an absolute kind of must see is the Georgian Theatre Royal. So this is um, Friars Wind. So the wines are alleyways. Uh, other uh, names for this narrow gate look gives access from the Bailey, the marketplace, the Franciscan Friary. 
So we've got another ruin to look at. So the town hall built in 1311, enabling the inhabitants to collect drinking water from the springs at the Friary. So we've got a theatre royal there. And uh, there's a grand tradition of drama here, and quite controversially, um, the Puritans, of course, um, cracked down. They hated drama and acting and fun and frivolity and all the good things of life they got rid of. Um, so it was all banned under Oliver Cromwell and his puritanical friends. Um, but actually in Richmond, there was a kind of tr tradition of non-conformity in that respect. And so in the pubs, um, drama continued, forbidden drama. So the pubs around here basically were sticking two fingers up to, uh, uh, to Oliver Cromwell. And uh, this, these pubs here, particularly the Fleece uh, next to us, um, were known as places where you could take in the art. So it's fantastic that in this location, the Georgian Theatre Royal, I don't know where, not, you can't sort of see inside there, but that's, that's the kind of interior of it. Um, so first opened in 1788, look, and then closed, reopened and restored. And uh, so built by, seven, by Samuel Butler. I'm just going to cross over. So they continued doing their plays. And then, of course, when they got rid of the Puritans, what they call the Restoration, um, was a very famous put, bit, bit of drama, wasn't it, called the Restoration Theatre, um, where many sort of very well-known playwrights, a lot of comedy, a lot of kind of frivolity, um, because basically everyone was relieved to get rid of these bloody killjoys. And uh, sad to say, I can only apologise, we kind of exported the problem. They got put on boats, and first off to Leiden with Stefan and uh, Natalie, I talked about it, and then uh, off they arrived on your shores. So we kind of exported uh, the issue, and uh, quite frankly, you're welcome to them. The Puritans, not great. But anyway, um, so here we are, final bit of the tour, and uh, I'm pretty low on my battery now. Um, we are in the grounds of the Friary, and uh, this is um, what remains of the choose flowers are absolutely lovely. The Franciscan Friary. Now we were talking earlier about those monks. And can you remember one of the things I said was they were really insistent, it's a lovely war memorial here, that um, there should be no uh, possessions. They would have to kind of forego all their wealth. They kind of believed that Christ was poor and that it wasn't possible to join holy orders and have any means of wealth. Well, these were the same the Franciscans. And in fact, it almost made them get labeled as heretics. Um, the Pope was very, very keen to have, to have Franciscans put to death because they preached that Christ had no purse. So consequently, the church should be poor. And this didn't go down at all well with the Popes and those that loved the buildings, the vestments, the robes, the good living that went with being uh, a high churchman in the Catholic Church. So they came within a whisker of, uh, of being declared heretics. But in a last minute deal at the Fourth Lateran Council of 1215, they were brought within the Catholic Church. So in the memory of the, all the airmen and airwomen who served and died for their country. Um, lovely flowers. So this is what's left for the friary. The friary give access to fresh water. So the friars were what they call a mendicant order. Um, insofar as these Franciscans, they got out in the community, they were teachers. Um, it wasn't about being closed off behind uh, the walls of a monastery. It was getting out and about preaching, teaching, helping, giving support to people, um, enacting the, 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 the catechism, you know, things through, through obviously um, looking after the poor, the sick, you know, those that have been imprisoned and so forth. So that's what's left is this beautiful tower. And uh, it's quite remarkable, isn't it, that uh, you know, here we are again on this same tour that has taken in you know, we started off with the ruins of a church, then a medieval church, the ruins of a monastery. We've managed to walk down the banks of the River Swale. We've seen the water up close. We've walked around the best Norman castle in England. And still here we are at the end with the ball to show you. The tower. And of course, like the other monasteries, it was taken down by Henry VIII in the 16th century. Um, but it's a very peaceful, it's a very special place and uh, I think a lovely place for us to, to finish off our time here together. How's that for a shot? Oh, a gimbal don't like that. There you go. 
So there we go. So that, my gimbal has just died. So I'm just going to unplug that and just switch it back on. So gimbals do not like that. that. That is the number one thing you can do to, uh, to upset your gimbal is to, uh, is to turn it upside down. So I am going to say that is a wrap. We've done what we've done. An hour and a half in Richmond. So I think that, that is a, it's more than your money's worth. So thank you everybody who's joined. Do give it a like, do give it a comment. Um, those that are able to make a financial contribution, the buy me a coffee and PayPal, absolutely fantastic. It all helps. Uh, many hands make light work. Everybody puts in a bit, those that can, and that enables us to keep going. So I've really, really enjoyed this. Enjoyed sharing the history, sharing the sites. And it's actually officially the second time we've been here. But the first one was built as a surprise tour. I came in the afternoon and not many people were on it. So I don't know if anybody is joining me for the second time in Richmond, but uh, this is the first time we've been for a tour that is built to be Richmond itself. So I have in enjoyed it enormously. I hope you have too. And uh, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Uh, so I'll be tomorrow. We're doing the walk around York, the kind of best of York, which I've not done for absolutely months. And uh, of course, the, the light is nice. Maybe we'll pop in the gardens, have a look at the flowers and uh, and just, you know, soak up we in the shambles. Of course we will. And uh, all the things that you love about York, the Minster, um, we'll be doing them tomorrow. So uh, do join me if you can tomorrow, 6 p.m. UK time for a, a jaunt around beautiful York. And uh, for now, thank you, everybody. It's been an absolute joy. And uh, I look forward to seeing you very, very soon. So from Richmond, I'm going to say goodbye.